welcome back. And today we're revisiting a bit of an old project. We're taking a look at this guy right here. This is the uh, 555 timer that I made using uh, 6AU6 vacuum tubes only. This is a pure hollow state 555. I called it the world's largest 555. It's probably also the world's heaviest 555. I machined the PCB myself on the mill. The legs are uh, cut steel, spot welded to nails. Uh, and uh, I think it's awesome. I love it. But in the last episode that we saw about the vacuum tube 555 timer, uh, I showed off what I called revision A, which was a more professional looking uh, solution. And uh, well, there hasn't been an update since then, and that was a long time ago. And that's because I've been going through a ton of different revisions. I'm on like revision five now, and the majority of it was focused around how to make the legs right. Uh, on revision one, uh, I had used aluminum legs and I tried to solder that, but you can't really solder to aluminum without proper flux and a whole bunch of uh, stuff that I didn't have to do it right. So I've been doing some thinking and I think that I've got it cracked here on revision five. And this is the revision five PCB. This is the main PCB and it's a beautiful PCB. Obviously I did not machine this one on my mill. Uh, this one was actually supplied by PCB way. PCB way reached out to me. They liked what I was doing on the channel. They asked if there was any way in which they could help. And well, this is a large PCB, so they can definitely help by hooking me up with these. And uh, they came through like legends. So, uh, well, this video is sponsored by PCB Way, but I'm gonna show you the actual product. You're gonna get a lot of close-up uh, shots of this throughout the rest of this video. So I want you guys to draw your own conclusions about what you think about the quality of PCB Way's stuff. So PCB Way, thank you for hooking me up with these. And uh, well, for everybody else, let's get to work. I wanna build one of these up give it a test and see how it works. So let's hop over to the bench and get started. First things first, let's take a look at the bare PCB without any components soldered onto it because we can actually see quite a lot going on from just looking at the silk screen here, which is a pretty nice high quality silk screen. A 555 timer has essentially two comparators or op amps that both feed into the set and reset pins of an SR flip-flop. And then the output of that SR flip-flop is uh, buffered for our output pin. The SR flip-flop itself can be reset through the reset pin. And then we finally have a discharge element that is made active depending on the state of the SR flip-flop. And it essentially connects the discharge pin to ground. And we can see all of that here. The uh, eight pins are exactly the same as a standard 555 timer with the exception of pin number five over here. Uh, this 555 needs uh, plus 24 volts and negative 12 volts and I couldn't find a good place to put it, so I put it on pin five, uh, but pin five is originally a control voltage that allows you to control the trigger voltage of one of the comparators, and I've actually put that on a little pin header over here. So we didn't lose any functionality, it's just not on uh, pin five anymore. Now the individual elements are split up and labeled. We have uh, op amp A here on the top, op amp B here on the bottom. These two right here are the SR flip-flop. Then we have our output cathode follower buffer and our discharge element here. And uh, coming from somebody who machines their own PCBs, having a silk screen is pretty fantastic. Every single resistor, uh, capacitor, or potentiometer is labeled. The uh, next big issue is how do we deal with the legs? Uh, having nails that you spot weld to is not ideal. And this is my solution. This is actually just a PCB with no solder mask and no silk screen. Uh, there's obviously also no through holes or traces at all. It's just pure exposed copper. Now this does have a hazel on it, hot air solder leveling, uh, and you can get lead free hazel for it. So it's actually safe to touch. But essentially, because it's a PCB and it's copper, you can solder to it incredibly easily. And around each of the uh, pins around the periphery here, you can see I've got holes cut out that these will slot into perfectly. And then there's little pads here that you can solder to. Now the pads are on the top here, but they're also on the bottom side of the PCB because that's where you're gonna be soldering to the leg. 
Now you may not want to connect everything to the leg, so I've also put uh, little through holes for pin headers next to each pin. So you can uh, solder a little pin header in there and connect wires up to that. And speaking of all this soldering, I think it's time to solder this one up. Now I don't even need to look at my uh, design file for this because having everything marked out on the solder mask makes it super easy. Just grab the components, pop them in place and give it a solder. Now this uh, board has been designed for a very specific type of vacuum tube socket. Normally I use these little one millimeter pin headers, but on uh, this one I'm using proper ceramic sockets that you can find on uh, most online retailers. All right, here it is all soldered up with 14 6AU6s populated in these ceramic sockets. The uh, PCB legs is their dream to solder up. That worked so much better than any of the other solutions that I had tried. Uh, I also love that aside from these uh, blue multi-turn potentiometers, you could have essentially built exactly this back in the 1950s. Now those multi-turn potentiometers raise a question. Why do I have these on here? Well, I designed this to work with six AU6s and uh, the two here form a long-tailed pair and this is a pretty sensitive pair. The uh, three after that are just uh, amplifying stages. And so these potentiometers adjust the bias of the input into each of the three amplifying stages. And you can actually adjust the sensitivity of each individual op amp to match the tubes that you have in here. Not just from an emission standpoint, but you could also put different tubes in here. So as long as you have a seven pin pentode that is pin compatible with a six AU6, you could put it in here and adjust the op amp to hopefully get this working. Uh, I have tested it with the six CB6, 6136, six DT6, 8136, six BZ6 and six BA6. And all of them, kind of work, some work better than others. It depends a lot on the tube itself, but tuning it is a bit of an involved process. And uh, it sure would be nice if that procedure was written down somewhere aside from just bouncing around in my old noggin. Uh, and also speaking of writing things down, it would be nice if we had some specifications on how the uh, hollow state UE555 worked. Uh, essentially, what I'm saying is that we need a data sheet for this thing. And it just so happens that I uh, have a data sheet for the UE555. On the first page of our data sheet here, we've got uh, some simple information uh, about the timer itself, as well as a couple of block diagrams so we can figure out what's going on. If we look at the next page here, we get a full schematic for what's on there. A lot of people were curious what the schematic for the 555 timer looked like, and well, here it is, freely available in the data sheet, which you can find at a link in the description below. On the next page, we have some uh, electrical characteristics for the uh, 555 here. Uh, there's some pretty embarrassing stuff on here, like the amount of output voltage drop uh, and the amount of current that it can supply. It's frighteningly small. But on the page after that, we get some example circuits. Uh, these are circuits that I have tested and should work. The next page here gives us some example waveforms. Uh, mostly I just wanted a page with waveforms on it because most data sheets have pages with waveforms. So I thought it would look neat. And finally on this page, we have our tuning and setup instructions. Uh, this is just going to tell us how to get those op amps set up correctly. So let's pull an oscilloscope out and we'll get those op amps tuned correctly following the instructions that are laid out here. All right, I've got it set up. The uh, vacuum tube 555 here is plugged into uh, plus 24 and a minus 12 volt supply here. It's on, the tubes are warm. I've got a signal generator here. This is my HP 200 CD. And I've got an oscilloscope here. This is my HP 150A. We'll be using all of these to uh, do our adjustment here. And we'll just go straight down the line. Uh, step number one says, using a jumper wire, connect the CV pin to ground. Uh, so I've got the jumper wire here. So we're just gonna connect that up to the CV pin right there. And then we'll connect that up to the ground leg right over here. Step number two says, using a signal generator, connect a low amplitude uh, waveform to pin six threshold. Uh, that's what the signal generator here is doing. I've got um, my cable right here. So we'll just 
bring that around and connect it up to threshold. And I'm actually gonna use the scope to take a look at what that signal looks like. And you can see it on the scope here. Uh, I've got the uh, volts per centimeter cranked all the way down here. And we're looking at about uh, 0.5 volts peak to peak on our sine wave here. And uh, I think that's gonna work perfectly. Um, now the sine wave that's coming out of my 200 CD oscillator here does not have a DC offset. I've just uh, adjusted the vertical position here so I can see, see it a little easier. Um, but it's going to go about uh, 0.25 volts above ground and 0.25 volts below ground. And that should be enough to get our op amps set up correctly. So moving on to the next step, it says connect an oscilloscope to test point TP1A. Uh, so I'll move our oscilloscope probe over to TP1A here. Uh, and then it says uh, adjust potentiometer P01A to achieve largest, most uniform waveform on oscilloscope. Right up at the top, we've got a little bit of something going on. So I'm gonna use my screwdriver here. I'm gonna put it on uh, the potentiometer and then I'm just gonna give this an adjustment. Now, if I adjust it too far, I flatten it out. And if I go too far in the opposite direction, it flattens out on the top end. So we just want it to be most uniform between the two points. And uh, that looks pretty good. So I think that's gonna be the uh, first potentiometer adjusted. So we'll move to TP1B and do the same adjustment on potentiometer 1B. All right, we've already got a really nice square wave showing up. Uh, but I'm gonna give the screwdriver a little bit of a spin here to see how we can adjust it. So yeah, we're just gonna adjust that so it's just about equal between the two. Nice, pretty square wave coming out there though. Uh, and so I think we can call a TP1B uh, adjusted there. So we'll move over to TP1C. All right, again, we've got a nice square wave here, but uh, the, the amplitude doesn't seem quite right. So we'll adjust it. Oh, I can bring the amplitude way on down. Uh, and there we go. Now we've got it going pretty much rail to rail. We've got this one pretty close. That means that uh, all we need to do is uh, remove the oscilloscope and the jumper wire and op amp A is totally adjusted. Now we just have to do the same procedure for op amp B. The only difference is that instead of connecting the CV pin to ground, we connect to this little 4.7 thousand ohm resistor that's right next to the ground pin right here. And then after that, we just follow the same procedure, except we do it for test point two, A, B, and C, and potentiometer two, A, B, and C. And with all of those adjusted, the whole thing should be working perfectly. All right, next let's test out a little bit of functionality. We'll do the Schmidt trigger because it's the easiest to set up. We just connect trigger and threshold to each other, and then we connect that to the center pin of a potentiometer, and then the other two pins of the potentiometer go between 24 volts and ground. And uh, that's what I've got set up on this little silver potentiometer here. Um, now the way this works is that there's going to be a little bit of a dead zone in the middle. I'm going to have to get as low as possible before it triggers and sends our output waveform to a low value. And yeah, there we go. So that triggered at about uh, one third over this way. And then if I rotate it the other way, even though we were, are where we were when we initially plugged it in, we're still low. I have to go to about two thirds. And then when I get to two thirds, it triggers and goes up. So there's that whole third in the middle where as long as we're in there, it doesn't change state. With the uh, 555 here, you have to DC offset it. So the trigger values are gonna be at around eight volts and 16 volts. Although I think in testing, it came out to about seven and a half and 15 and a half. That means it requires a little bit of extra circuitry to take whatever sine wave you have coming in and uh, DC offset it up with a peak of 24 volts or whatever. Uh, so instead of doing that, we're just going to go ahead and skip over to a stable mode because I think that's gonna be a lot more interesting. And I have that set up on this potentiometer over here. So we just tie threshold and trigger to each other, just like on the Schmidt trigger. And then we tie that to the small point between a potentiometer and a small capacitor. And then on the potentiometer, we have uh, the other side going to 24 volts, and then we have the center pin going to discharge. And so if I take the uh, discharge jumper here and connect it up to the center pin of this uh, gold potentiometer here, yeah. <laughs> 
Look at that square wave. It's just a nice, beautiful square wave. And then I can actually adjust it and change it with the potentiometer here. That is awesome. <laughs> So we're at uh, 0 0.5 milliseconds per division. So if we do 0 0.51, uh, 1.52, if we put our falling edge on that two there, that should be just about 500 hertz. Uh, now, if we wanna go faster, we can change out the capacitor. I've got a, a little 103 in there right now. So I'll just change that over to a 10, a very small capacitor. And uh, yeah, you can see that is much, much faster. So we'll knock down to uh, 0.1 milliseconds per division here. Uh, and I'll give that a little bit of an adjustment. All right, that looks like uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, milliseconds from falling edge to falling edge. And uh, I think that comes out to two and a half kilohertz. Uh, so that's pretty good. We can start to see some limitations. We can see that our falling edge actually takes a little bit of time and our rising edge also takes a little bit of time. So the faster we get, the more pronounced this, uh, I believe they call that slew rate is going to become, which means that eventually we're going to hit a uh, ceiling where we can't actually oscillate it any faster because our falling edge is running into our rising edge. So uh, yeah, the 555 vacuum tube timer is working perfectly. So there we go, the final revision of the uh, UE555 all vacuum tube timer is complete. It looks absolutely brilliant and uh, it puts out a pretty nice little square wave. Uh, so the question now is how do you get one of these if you want one? Uh, initially, I had thought about maybe building these into a kit that I could put in a box and I could ship to anybody that wanted to buy one, but um, man, I ran the numbers and I just can't come up with an even remotely affordable way to do that for you as well as for me. It would end up costing uh, far too much money for you and uh, it would take all of my time and I would still take a loss on each kit. Uh, so I just, I can't afford to do it that way. But I don't want to just keep this to myself because I know that there's some people out there that are really fascinated by this and would like to either improve upon it or build one to put on the shelf or something like that. So I'm going to put everything uh, up available for free at the links in the description below. So there's gonna be uh, the data sheet in uh, PDF form so you can download the data sheet. Uh, also, I'm going to put the full Gerber files below, which means that you can just take those Gerber files, put them into a zip and upload them to PCBWay and get exactly the same stuff that you see here. I'll also include links to the types of tubes that I use. You can find those on eBay, uh, as well as the sockets. You can find those on most online retailers. Uh, other than that, uh, everything else is really generic. It's just resistors and a couple of capacitors, most of which you probably already have floating around in a junk bin. So uh, if you are interested in building one of these yourself, all of the information you need to do so is in the links in the description below. Uh, now, before we sign off, there is one more question that I do want to address, and that is, what's next? Uh, the 555 timer here is cool, and the 555 timer, the IC version, is probably one of the greatest ICs ever built. Uh, they've made millions and millions and millions of them, uh, but, it's not the greatest IC because the greatest IC is the CSS 555 timer. It is essentially a 555 timer with a built-in one byte ROM and a six step decade counter. Uh, the one byte ROM can program the decade counter to set up uh, divide by two steps to essentially give you really long delays 
Uh, and then you can also change the uh, trigger voltage from one third VCC and two third VCC to uh, 10% and 90% VCC. And uh, so a programmable 555 sounds really cool and my brain has been going non-stop on how to potentially build that uh, with vacuum tubes. So the first step is going to be uh, optimizing and making this design a little more efficient. So uh, for the op amp, I think instead of six AU6s, we might use something like six CL6s because they perform a little bit better at low voltage. Um, and then we got to figure out how to make a one byte ROM. For that, I'm thinking maybe uh, core rope memory. Uh, that would be very cool. You program it by weaving the rope through. The uh, next really hard thing to tackle is going to be the decade counter, though, uh, especially at low voltage. I do really want to keep this at plus 24 and minus 12 volts, uh, but uh, man, decade counters at low voltage with vacuum tubes is hard. If we had more voltage, we could do it out of neons and that would be awesome. Uh, but then we need like a hundred volts. So I'm thinking maybe we can do something with thyrotrons, like a 2D21 thyrotron. That would be really cool as well. Although those do run really hot. Uh, but the challenge of building a programmable 555 timer is just uh, too enticing to ignore. I just, my brain can't let it go. So uh, if you want to see more of that, definitely let me know in the comments below. And if you have ideas on how to build a low voltage decade counter out of vacuum tubes, I am all ears because that is the biggest hurdle. And that's the one I've been uh, having trouble overcoming. Uh, but for now, I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.